If you've spent a little bit of time in DaVinci Resolve's color page, you've probably been exposed to both the primaries palette, where our lift and our gamma and our gain and our offset and all that stuff live, as well as the HDR zones palette. And at first glance, these two palettes, these two tool sets seem pretty similar, don't they? We have the same sort of trackball icons in both cases. We seem to have the ability to control the tonality and the color in different zones of our image by moving things around. So the question sort of naturally comes up like, okay, which one is better? How do I know when to use which? How do I know when I might want to avoid using one over the other? That's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the real difference between these two tool sets and when you want to use which, when you might want to avoid using one or the other. Before we dive into Resolve, if you haven't had a chance to subscribe yet, make sure you do so. We've got two new videos a week coming out every week here on YouTube. We have a live Q&A session that we do every Friday morning, grade school, where we talk about what we've been exploring in that week's videos. So lots of great stuff on color grading and color grading inside of DaVinci Resolve. And if you're looking to grow in this area, this channel is where you want to be. Let's dive into Resolve and talk about the HDR zones versus the primaries palette. So. Let's start by talking about a principle that really points to my book, The Colorist Ten Commandments. One of the quote unquote commandments, one of the chapters in that book is entitled Simplicity Beats Complexity. And if you want to save yourself the read, it's not a long read, but if you want to get it in like a sentence, the simplicity versus complexity chapter simply says that if you can get something done with a simple tool, you shouldn't use a more complex tool to get it done. That makes sense, right? The simpler your tool, the more effectively, the more quickly, the more efficiently you're going to be able to use it. So here's the TLDR. Here's the simple rule of thumb. If you don't take away anything else from this video, but this, if you're trying to decide between the HDR zones palette and the primaries palette, the primaries win by default. If you can get it done with the primaries, get it done with the primaries. You're going to be more effective. You're going to be more efficient. It's when you want to do something you can't do in the primaries that the HDR zones palette become an interesting option to consider. Okay. That's principle number one. Now let's talk about some of the differences in application in practice between these two tool sets. Let's take a look at this image here. And I'll just point out before we dive in that I am working as I always do in a color managed environment. If you're not sure what that means, or if you need to brush up on color management, I encourage you to check out lots of uh, the great content that we have here on the channel on that subject. But for today, I'm just going to mention that I'm working color managed. And I'll also point out that I have my template node graph in place like I always do. And I'm going to start working my way through this template node graph and grade up this image to my taste, to my preference. I'm going to start here in my exposure node and go to my offset. I actually really like where my exposure is sitting. I'm going to open up maybe just slightly, but other than that, I think I'm good here. It's really this ratio node where I need to put in some more work. My issue here, the next thing that I'm seeing, what I want to work on is the fact that my highlights and my uh, sort of overall exposure out this window are rather hot compared to my subject, right? I want to bring those things in. They're a little bit distracting. They're kind of pulling my eye away from the subject. So, one way that I could do that would be to go to my gain wheel here within my primaries and pull things down. And you can see that as I do so, cool, that's working. We're definitely pulling in things out there in the background, right? All good to go, right? Eh, not so much. We're moving our subjects exposure a lot when we do that, right? We really need something a bit more focused than the very broad adjustment that we get with a gain uh, wheel, right? So. Something that we might try here within our primaries, we could go to our highlights, maybe pull things in there. That's a more localized adjustment, isn't it? That's having less effect on my subject. But by the time I get down to the exposure level that I'm looking for, for the area out that window, I'm still having quite an effect on her, aren't I? And there might be a way to sort of blend my adjustments together and work my highlights against say my gamma or my lift or my offset to get a good fit. And that's actually a great strategy. That's something that I encourage. However, for today, let's say for the sake of argument, we're looking for a knob. We're looking for a single knob that we can turn that's going to bring that down and leave our subject alone. Okay. That's not a crazy idea. That's not a crazy thing to want to do. That's the kind of idea that might lead us to swing over into the HDR zones palette and give things a try over there. So let's go over to the HDR zones palette and get sort of oriented to the way that this palette works. So if we compare the HDR zones to our primaries, our primaries are essentially slicing up our image into three zones, bottom end, middle, and high end with lots and lots of overlap between those two. 
That overlap is good. It makes uh, for broader, smoother adjustments, but there is lots of interaction. As we saw when we were trying to pull our highlights in just now, that was having a huge effect on our midtones as well when we made that gain adjustment. Here in the HDR zones palette, we are able to make narrower, more precise manipulations because instead of having three zones effectively, we have eight. We have our dark, shadow, light, or rather we have our black, dark, shadow, and then we have light, and then we've got highlight, and then we go all the way up to specular. Ah, I take it back. I can't count. Apparently I should stick to being a colorist and avoid the math. We have six zones total here. So we have double the amount of uh, focus that we are able to uh, apply in our primaries. All right. So what that means is if we look at an agenda like the one we have here, where we want to pull in our background, I'm just going to go ahead and reset this node back to where it started. And what I can do is find the appropriate zone. In this case, that appropriate zone is going to be my highlight zone and I can pull in my exposure. And remember, I said a moment ago, I'm looking for a knob. Well, there it is. That works, doesn't it? That's making a very targeted adjustment to that area. And it is barely touching my subject if it's touching her at all. So check there. We're getting that narrower adjustment. We're getting that single knob that's doing what we want. But take a look at what you're seeing here. Anybody, if you ever like, this is a, a, an odd analogy, but like I used to love to drink Coca-Cola. I don't drink Coca-Cola anymore. I try to take better care of myself. But when I first was trying to kick Coca-Cola, I would go, oh, maybe I'll drink a Coke Zero. And you start to drink it, and at first it tastes just like the real thing. But then that aftertaste kicks in, and you're like, that's not the real thing. That's not the, where's the sugar? I'm looking for the sugar, right? That's kind of how I feel about what we just did. Like, yeah, that's doing a thing. But as you start to sit with it for a minute, you're like, yeah, but it looks weird. It feels odd, doesn't it? Now, I'm not saying that to dog on the HDR Zones palette. I'm simply pointing out that when you start to make narrower, more uh, sharp adjustments to your image, it's easy to get results like this. In fact, it's sort of unavoidable when you start doing these things more aggressively that you're going to get a result like this. But there are some uh, mechanisms within the HDR Zones palette that are going to allow us to mitigate this somewhat. So if we wanted to, we could pop our Zones window out here to the right. I'm going to turn off my scopes for a moment so you can see what I'm working on. And you can see these zones and what what light versus highlight versus specular means we can actually customize these and that's pretty cool so let's go over here to our uh, highlight zone where we've been working and what i want to do is change around my pivot for that zone that's what it's called in the hdr zones palette so i'm doing that here on my control surface but you can also just do it by sliding this zone and you can see that more or less of that background is being included when i sweep this to the left or to the right. And I can get a more naturalistic reproduction by making this zone a bit larger, like so. So that's starting to feel pretty reasonable. But interestingly, you can see there's sort of an edge where now I'm beginning to affect my subject again. So it's getting more organic feeling, but it's also getting broader in nature. That's a telling truth that we are observing right there. The broader our adjustments are, the more naturalistic they feel but sometimes we want to do something narrower. So it's all about kind of striking a balance there. So I've opened up that zone a little bit, but it's still not necessarily the most organic result that uh, we could get. So that's either uh, a question of using a broader tool or maybe just, just not hitting this adjustment so hard. So I'm going to go back and maybe just pull in my exposure a little bit like so. Okay. So that's a great example of the difference in approach that we might take to a problem using our primaries versus using the HDR zones and some of the pros and cons on both sides, as well as some of the unique features that we have within the HDR zones that of course we don't have within our primaries. I can't designate what my zone for high end is in the primaries. That just is what it is. But here in the HDR zones, you can actually move around and change your zones. You can even change your fall off, which is how gradually you are feathering in and out of that zone is here within the palette. So it's a really interesting tool with a, a lot to offer when you are using it in the right setting and not overplaying your hand and getting the kind of inorganic results that we're looking at right here. And the other thing that I'll point out in terms of sort of like laying out the pros and cons of both of these tools is the amount of time that we have spent today talking about the HDR zones palette, even just the amount of time that I've spent on trying to finesse this adjustment 
within the HDR zones palette, the average shot that I grade as a colorist in my professional practice, I do not have that much time. I, I need to be grading, I need to be spending an average of about 20 seconds per shot in a given pass. It's a little bit more if we're doing a commercial, but generally speaking, I need to be moving at a rate of about 20 seconds per shot in order to grade all the shots that I need to for a particular job, okay? So that's the last thing that I'll point out about like, well, when should we use which of these versus the other? The HDR zones palette, that's like that's like dessert. That's like uh, a, a special thing you can break out when you really need it, but you can't have it all day, every day. It just doesn't work. You need to break it out when your primaries won't do, when a simpler approach won't work, and you really need to make a narrower, more targeted adjustment as we're seeing here. So I hope that gives you a general sense of the key differences that I see between the primaries and the HDR zones palette and uh, some of the uh, different results that we can achieve by tackling each of these uh, palettes uh, to accomplish our goals. And I am just gonna point out that if we do go all the way back to the good old primaries and we do a simple combination of bringing in our highlights, and I'm just gonna keep going until I've got them where I want, not worry about the fact that my subject's moving a little bit, and then going to my gamma and opening things up a little bit here, I'm basically gonna play my highlights and my gamma against each other. I'm having to compromise in a sense, right? I'm not getting to have that razor sharp control and focus that I had in the HDR zones palette, but where I've netted out is with exactly what I wanted in the first place, which is a healthy exposure on my subject and a less distracting background. So oftentimes blending between overlapping adjustments is exactly what we want when we're color grading rather than one single discrete knob that does a thing that at first taste tastes just like Coca-Cola, but after you sit with it for, for a minute, it's uh, more like a like a Coke Zero. So I hope that helps you guys. Hope that gives you something to think about when you are considering which tools you want to use in uh, your color grading practice. If you enjoyed this content, if you enjoy learning more about color grading and working inside of DaVinci Resolve, make sure you subscribe, make sure you turn on your notifications. Looking forward to seeing you here in the next recorded video. And of course, uh, in our live sessions that we do on Friday mornings, grade school, we always have a blast. Hope to see you there as well.